So here it is. You asked for it. The top 10 transceivers of the 1970s. Yeah, we're going to cover all of those classic analog radios uh, that really end the 60s era with tubes and we start to get into the solid state era. These still are analog radios. We're not quite ready for synthesis yet. We're not uh, doing digital displays, but they're going to come pretty quick. The top 10 list will uh, include a lot of your favorites and probably, for many of you, your first radio. So uh, if you haven't seen the first video, which is the top 10 of the 1960s, I'll put the link below, but uh, you might want to watch that first because the real classic first generation transceivers are covered in that first video. But now we're into the 70s. This is really my era when I get in, got into ham radio. And uh, also, you, we're going to have a little bit of CB in this too. Remember, a lot of these radios, uh, they snuck the 11 meter band in on them. And uh, the gateway drug to ham radio for many of us was CB. Stand by, the top 10 transceivers of the 1970s. We're going to cover a lot of radios. And uh, of course, at the end of the 60s, we have radios that are competing mostly on power. I put out more watts with this radio than you put out with that radio. The era of the sweep tube and the 700 watts PEP, and uh, it gets kind of ridiculous towards the end of the 60s. But uh, once we cross that line into the era where we start to have solid state equipment and the Japanese invasion, things are going to change quickly. And suddenly you're going to get more features, more performance, and the price is not going to spike. It's going to remain constant. Now, the American manufacturers had to respond to this, and we're going to talk about what happened there as well. And uh, I've got a couple of classics in front of me here. Uh, certainly the Fox Tango, the FT-101, and the, uh, the Trio, uh, Kenwood, TS-520, 820, and so on. And, of course, the California radios like the Atlas. We're going to go through all of this in this video. Welcome to the top 10 transceivers of the 1970s. So the Swan 700 is really the last of the line of the classic 1960 all-valve or all-tube designs that uh, were so popular. This is a single conversion super heterodyne, both in transmit and receive. And it uses the double plate sheet beam type uh, balance modulator uh, with single conversion and a 5.5 megahertz IF. Um, this is a very quiet and hot receiver. Now, of course, the penalty for a single conversion transceiver is that the VFO has to operate at some pretty embarrassingly high frequencies. Imagine trying to make a simple two transistor VFO work at 22 megahertz. Let's talk about the Tempo 1. This is Yesu's uh, big, big push into the low cost transceiver market. And uh, this is a crossover rig used by hams, but certainly modified and used by C beers. Uh, the FT200 uh, was marketed as the Henry Tempo 1. It was also sold as the Summer Camp uh, transceiver. So this was sold all around the world, and uh, this is a very popular radio. It uses the World Radio Lab's heterodyne VFO idea. So you don't have a high frequency VFO, you handle that with these heterodyne crystals. So it's very easy to change the, uh, the frequency band of this unit just by swapping out crystals, tweaking a couple stages, suddenly you're in the 11 meter band. Yes, another Yesu. This is the FTDX 560, 570 family. And if tube count is your game, this is the winner with 20 tubes and uh, a very high power uh, transceiver indeed. And, quite a handful to uh, pick up. Uh, this really uh, represents the pre-hybrid days, the glory days of tubes. Soon we start to see solid state creep in. But the Yesu represents uh, really the end of the, the tube era. Um, of course, a lot of the American companies would have tubes, but um, and we'll cover some of them. But uh, this is just a big old transceiver. 
So now we go to a, uh, a Galaxy GT550 and uh, World Radio Labs have been sold by Leo Meyerson to High Gain in the 60s and they were uh, fronting uh, his last uh, creation, the GT550, and selling it as the 550A. Uh, my Elmer actually bought one of these setups for our the Underground uh, Civil Defense Center had the full Galaxy setup. Uh, this is a uh, uh, 1960s design that's been pressed into service for the 1970s. Uh, still retains the heterodyne VFO. It does have a few more transistors. We're starting to get more hybridized with this set. The little Atlas 210 215X radios uh, built in Solana Beach, California were Herb Johnson designs. Herb Johnson founded Swan Radio back in the 60s and eventually sold that off to Cubic. But he started another company, Atlas, and this fully solid state miniature transceiver really became popular. Um, it's, it's a 100 watt class radio, meaning it's uh, 200 watts PEP. Uh, CW, kind of an afterthought, but a uh, wonderful little radio, very, very popular. And uh, later on, he would do the 350XL, which would become their flagship radio. We need to pimp your heat kits. Imagine if an FT101 and ACTZ's radio funk had a love child. Introducing the Sommerkamp FL288. Danke schön, Helga. Ja, ja, if a... Yesu FD-101 and a CB had a love child, it would be the Summer Camp TS-288, very popular in Germany and the UK. This is quite a radio. And this really is a uh, FD-101, an early 101 design, uh, with uh, CB channelization. For many folks, the Drake TR-7 represents the number one radio on this list. And maybe it would be number one except for the pretty high price. The Drake TR7 is a solid state amateur band transceiver covering 160 through 10 meters. The modes include USB, LSB, CW, RTTY, and AM. It provides coverage from 1.5 to 30 megahertz in receive mode without crystals, without gaps. How does it do this? Superior receive performance is achieved by using up conversion, specifically to 48 megahertz. This takes all the birdies right out of the band. Magnificent design. Looking inside, we see a plug-in card system reminiscent of top-of-the-line military surveillance and intercept equipment. And this radio came early, guys, early in the 1970s. Truly groundbreaking radio, the Drake TR-7. So if I didn't have Tentec in this grouping, I would probably be crucified by the group. Uh, the Tentec Model 540 and the 500 series in general was a classic solid state transceiver made in Tennessee. It covered uh, 80 through 10 meters in 500 kilohertz segments. And remarkably, this is a single conversion superheterodyne with a 9 megahertz IF, much like an old Galaxy, but a solid state radio. So it puts a lot of stress on a PTO VFO system. A full 200 watts input power with a no tune system. So this is a little bit of a step up from the Atlas, which was known to chew up finals if you did not tune uh, the antenna well. The early versions of the Triton uh, were analog dial. The later had digital readout, which was very nice and bright. Um, we have to mention the low power Argonaut but it really doesn't belong in this list because that's a, a real QRP transceiver and it deserves a video on its own in the QRP section. Another note, these uh, early solid state radios uh, really came into their own in the 70s, although there were a lot of hybrid rigs and some purely tube rigs at the time. Uh, the Tentec and the Atlas really represent um, a groundbreaking approach at ham radio. Also, I have to note that Motorola was not happy with the Triton name as they had a whole radio product line with that name. 
So they uh, made some threats, and thus the Triton was rebranded as the 500 series or the 540. In the 1960s, basically anything below $500 was considered an economy transceiver. By the 1970s, especially toward the late 70s, anything below $1,000 was considered economy. The added outboard power supply, AC and DC, was another problem with the older tube radios. So Kenwood, with its hybrid technology and built-in power supplies, you know, found in the 520 and other radios, really targets the sweet spot of just below $1,000. The 520 uses many parts on small circuit boards and it has very low production cost being built in Japan. They use this to great advantage. Uh, they got great performance out of the radio and at a reasonable cost. U.S. companies simply could not overcome these advantages of offshore production simply by employing better technology, more solid state, and so on. So many thousands of these Kenwoods and other uh, Eastern radios flooded the market. The cost just stayed too high for American manufacturers to compete. Something had to give. Tentec, for instance, reduced packaging and control costs in an attempt to compete on price, but ultimately was accused of a flimsy feel despite great performance. So what is the number one transceiver of the 1970s? I don't think it's fair to consider the synthesized radios that just arrived in 78, 79, like the 830S by Kenwood, but the 820S certainly looks like a winner. And the ASU FT101 in all of its flavors would be my personal choice as number one. If you're still out there and have not been disgusted by anything I've said so far, I do have to say there's not one answer because we didn't set any rules or specifications as a criteria. But I can say that if we consider value and features, the hybrid Kenwoods and Yesus certainly are going to dominate in this position. If we consider the economy-minded El Cheapo ham, like uh, my Elmer might have been, who likes to build equipment, Heathkit is still easily going to win with its fantastic Hot Water 101 kit. And the numbers of uh, Heathkit sold prove that. If we're talking about raw technology, power and so on, then you have to consider those super radios like the Signal 1 and the NCX 1000 and the Drakes. Let's look at the Heath kit first. So let's talk about the very successful Hot Water 101. Uh, the 101 was ready for Christmas 1970 and it was produced all the way to 1983. Uh, keeping the HW101's price tag down uh, between $249 and no higher than $399 by the end of its amazing run. Uh, basically this radio was a lower cost and updated SB100 variant. Uh, without the Linear Master Oscillator, uh, which was what Keith Kitt called the PTO. Instead it used a conventional coal pits with a variable capacitor and vernier, but with a clever hybrid VFO circuit with a voltage regulated FET followed by a 6AU6 broadband uh, buffer. The HW104 which has a nice digital display, a more modern Heath kit, was supposed to be the 101's direct successor, a response to the Japanese invasion hybrids in the same spirit as Tentec was going. But that 104 really never took off and it was produced only until 1975 with the 101 living longer. Uh, when I worked for Motorola, I had a colleague, a ham, and he was a great technician. He built one of those HW104s uh, quite expertly, but he was never completely satisfied with that radio. Okay, here's my number one, the Yesu FT101, another hybrid radio from Japan. Built-in power supplies for AC and mobile use and this radio dominated the 1970s market. Very popular also in the CB world having the 11 meter band included uh, as well as 160 meters. So right out of the box in 1972 the FT-101s were made with uh, plug-in circuit boards that could be sent to the dealer or factory. The Yesu uh, FT-101 
uh, was groundbreaking in that it used plug-in modules for the major uh, components. Uh, this made uh, uh, a big splash in the amateur radio community. Um, the ability to use card extenders and to be able to repair the radio uh, with these modules simply by plugging in another module was something that uh, just hadn't been done in uh, the low-end commercial side or in many of the ham radios of the 1960s. Also, these are proper circuit boards in that they are mounting the RF components. Uh, they're mounting the RF components through a ground plane, and it's a double-sided board with plenty of ground. This is really a step above most of the circuit cards you see in the 60s. I saw my first 101, I think in the 1973 field day, uh, when we had this hippie college professor show up uh, with his pop-up camper with a 101. And uh, compared to the old-timers TR3s and the nicotine-stained Halicrafters radios we were using, this FT-101 was a sleek alien spacecraft. So the TSA-20. This is the third number one radio. Kind of unfair that I've picked three radios to be number one, but I think the 820 you're going to find is uh, probably our real winner. The TS-820 is a completely different beast than the TS-520. The 520 is a conventional dual conversion superhead with heterodyne mixing, VFO, and so on. The 820 is a single conversion system with an 8.83 MHz IF, and it introduces frequency synthesis. Phase noise aside, returning to the many advantages of single conversion was a very bold step for Kenwood and it makes this set more suited to direct digital display, adding bands, and so on. It uses a conventional 5 MHz VFO and a heterodyne scheme like its forefathers, but this time it's phase compared to a v VCO that drives both the TX and RX mixers. Basically in this system the VCO signal is mixed with the heterodyne signal and thereby converted to a signal of 3.3 to 3.83 MHz common to all the bands. This is further mixed with a carrier to be converted into 5 to 5.5 MHz. This signal is phase compared with a VFO signal of 5.5 to 5.0 MHz. The comparison output is thus obtained and returned to the VCO and that's used to lock it. So this is a pretty sophisticated radio compared to what we've been talking about up to now. So we have to talk about the difference between radios of the late 60s, which were going for higher power, power, power. Uh, basically, if you could do 
500 watts PEP, why not do 700 watts PEP? And if you could do 1,000 watts PEP, let's try for that in the same packaging. And uh, there was going to be a switch, though, and that switch was features, price, and performance driven. And uh, one way of getting performance is by paying top dollar for top quality parts. In other words, if I want to use a Collins mechanical filter and it costs me $50 to put that filter in a radio, I will get good performance. But what some of the Far Eastern manufacturers figured out was I can do the same thing as that $50 Collins filter. I just need to use some low-cost ceramic filters or crystal filters and maybe four or five transistors. And that will cost me uh, parts count and the... Uh, the total bill of bill of material cost of maybe $15. $15 to replace a Collins mechanical filter that might cost $50. That's the type of economy that starts to happen with some of these radios. Solid state clearly takes over and it's a price versus performance trade-off. So in the end, we find that complexity is not a problem. We can make very complex circuits and we can use hundreds of transistors to perhaps uh, replace 10 tubes. So if 200 transistors replaces 10 tubes, the transistor circuit wins. And that's how the Far Eastern manufacturers easily overtook the American tube type equipment of the late 60s. Now, it would be very naive of me to say that these were purely ham radio transceivers. Um, certainly the FT-101, the Fox Tango, including the 11 meter band, was a big boon to the CBers who wanted to uh, experience higher power. And definitely more radios were sold to CBers than to hams actually with this model. So maybe that's clever marketing, but uh, I can tell you the gateway drug to ham radio for many was through CB and in particular through this transceiver and types like it, like the Siltronics. Okay, so maybe I didn't cover your radio, uh, please comment. Someplace in the comments, talk about your radio from the 1970s and how could I possibly have missed it. And uh, you notice I kind of winked at QRP because the 70s was also the era where QRP went from simple home brew type QRP to actual commercial units that were dedicated to mostly CW QRP. However, the groundbreaking Argonaut transceiver from Tentec uh, really is the, uh, the bridge that brought QRP into uh, single sideband. And uh, this was the first time someone dared to do something like that. And uh, we're gonna have a video devoted to the QRP revolution that occurred in the 1970s. And I hope you've enjoyed this video and uh, stay tuned to the Microwave One channel for more on your favorite radios.